Hi, so good morning. Uh, as you can probably tell, uh, my paper is titled The Logging and Analysis of Lift Journeys Using an Accelerometer. Uh, so what I'll be discussing today are the techniques I use to create a low-cost method of logging continuous lift motion uh, with a significant emphasis on the keywords low-cost and continuous. So uh, this is just a brief scope of what I'll be uh, covering in today's presentation. Uh, I'll begin with an introduction into why I decided to tackle this project. Uh, so why is it necessary and why the existing solutions are unsatisfactory? Uh, then into the fun part, I'm going to try and make software sound exciting. Um, I'll go a little into the methods I took to tackle the problem I faced and the challenges that arose, especially with the introduction of real-world data. Um, I'll then finish with a quick analysis of the software, uh, whether from the results it could be considered a feasible solution to the problem, and what improvements could be made to future versions. Um, so I'll just quick introduce uh, myself and the project. Uh, as I said, my name's Anna Peters. Uh, I'm starting my fourth and final year at the University of Southampton, uh, studying for a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics. So not quite lifts, but... There we go. Um, so I wrote this paper with the support of Richard Peters, who, if you haven't already guessed by our surnames, is both my dad and my boss. <laughs> Lots of fun. Um, so the problem I was tasked with was to develop a piece of software that could process data collected by a low-cost computer and an accelerometer placed on top of a lift car. Um, so the software would have to be able to provide a summary of uh, lift stops analysed by floor and time of day, uh, whilst also considering accelerometer drift, noise and other data anom anomalies that come along. Um, so some lift manufacturers have already developed their own systems to allow this data to be collected. Um, However, they're actually typically uh, manufacturer specific, so they're only compatible with the manufacturer's own products. Um, as a result, it's surprisingly difficult and usually very expensive to collect the data from lifts. Um, so actually using an accelerometer to collect this data alleviates its difficulties and is significantly cheaper. Uh, you can simply place the accelerometer on top of the lift and leave it to collect the data necessary for as however long you want. Um, so what I'm going to run through now is a few of the potential applications of the software and the data it outputs. So essentially, why do I want to know where a lift has been? Um, so I'll begin with lift traffic analysis. Um, so when planning lift installations in new buildings and addressing problems in existing buildings, it's necessary to understand the lift traffic. Um, so I was recently involved in a lift traffic survey, uh, which was completed at a major international transport terminal, uh, where the data was collected to simulate possible solutions to their lift problem. Um, the data was collected manually by a team of human observers, uh, including me, which is obviously very time consuming and very expensive. Uh, essentially, we sat in lifts counting people coming in and out and logging the floors over the day. Um, so as I mentioned, the aim of the project was to be able to develop software that could provide a summary of the lift stops analysed by floor and time of day. So essentially, it would create a spatial plot of the lift motion automatically with en without any need for human interaction. Um, so this data collected through the software could also be applied in the development of mathematical models uh, which can extrapolate the passenger demand from stops. Uh, so these methods have uh, previously relied heavily on data collection from the lift controllers and progress has been significantly slowed because it's difficult to access this data. Uh, so if successful, the project will be able to provide the data necessary to continue with the development of these methods, uh, eventually allowing the traffic demand of lifts to be understood without the need of human observers. So next I'll go on to lift performance. Uh, lift performance time takes a major role in the planning of lift installations. Uh, it essentially measures the time taken for a lift to travel from one floor to the next, and is composed of what I've put in the left image. Um, so over time, the performance of a lift may deteriorate due to poor maintenance and adjustment. Um, so as part of the lift traffic survey carried out, uh, analysis is also carried out on the kinematics of single lift trips. So the right-hand figure uh, plots the design velocity profile of the lift against the data measured used for an accelerometer. Um, it's clear that the trip in real time was taking close to two seconds longer than designed. So although for one single trip this delay would appear neg negligible, uh, over hours and days the delays accumulate to a significant reduction in performance. So poor performance time is regularly the cause of reduced handling capacity and increased passenger waiting times. Uh, so the software created along with further developments could have the capability to monitor and identify when performance time is deteriorating. 
So by being able to recognise deteriorating performance time, it's likely that improved efficiencies will be seen. So rather than one-off scheduled maintenance being carried out, the software can alert technicians when an issue is identified and what the issue is. Uh, so this allows lifts to be tuned correctly and only when necessary. Uh, and finally, the capability to predict deteriorating lift performance actually carries on to another potential application of the software, uh, lift monitoring. So because interfacing with lift controllers is expensive, uh, the monitoring of lift installations is actually surprisingly rare. So through the application of artificial intelligence, it's actually possible to develop a predictive maintenance capability into the software. Um, so as the name says, rather than scheduled maintenance, components can be monitored, allowing predictions to be made for when maintenance is required, uh, such that its lifetime is maximised. So it could be, could be possible for future versions of the software to detect with reasonable confidence when a lift is broken down, uh, as regular patterns of movement will cease. Uh, so other possibilities include detecting that adjustment is required. So for example, if a lift is not levelling properly. So uh, now for the fun part. Uh, for this section of the presentation, I'll briefly cover the methods I took to create this software. So I want to begin by introducing a key concept that played a major role in the development of the software, uh, which is named Ideal Lift Kinematics. Uh, this is defined as the study of the motion of a lift car in a shaft without reference to mass or force. So for passenger carrying lifts, there are limits on the maximum values of jerk and acceleration, which are defined what a human perceives as comfortable. Uh, so ideal lift kinematics takes into consideration this human comfort criteria and from that it's become possible to derive equations that represent this ideal motion. Uh, these equations can be plotted as continuous functions that represent the optimum displacement, velocity, acceleration and jerk profiles of a lift. So you can see here it's all a little bit overwhelming, but uh, so the rows of the jerk, acceleration, velocity and displacement profiles for the three possible scenarios of lift motion. Uh, the first one being the lift reaching full speed, uh, the second being the lift reaching full acceleration but not full speed, and the third one with the lift reaching neither full acceleration or speed. Um, so for the purposes of the project, it was necessary to model each trip as accurately as possible. Uh, so modern variable speed drives which actually control the lift's motion can be programmed to match the ideal lift kinematics curves very closely. Um, so it was therefore decided that the best approach to tackle this project was to fit the measured data to these idealised kinematics plots. Um, so whilst a complete knowledge of the derivations is not essential, uh, a clear understanding of the shape of the curves is what's essential. So I want to quickly mention the mathematical concepts of integration and differentiation, which I'm sure most of you will remember from school. Um, I won't go into great detail other than re uh, refresh the relationships between displacement, velocity, acceleration and jerk, and how it's possible to transfer between them using integration and differentiation, as it shows on the slide. So, uh, fun animation, we begin with the ideal displacement profile. So in this case, it's the vertical distance from the lift starting position. Um, by differentiating the displacement profile, you achieve the velocity profile, which is the rate of change displacement. Uh, again, uh, by differentiating the velocity profile, you achieve the acceleration profile, which is the rate of change of velocity. And finally, by differentiating the acceleration profile, you achieve the jerk profile, which is the rate of change of acceleration. And again, it's then possible to work backwards, uh, back to displacement by simply integrating all the profiles. So the software was developed such that it would be able to accurately process a full set of raw accelerometer data, similar to that shown in the top image. Uh, to simplify the problem, the data set can be isolated into a series of single up and down lift trips uh, that can each be analysed individually. So the lower image is an example of a single up trip isolated from the full data set. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, the software will best fit the ideal kinematics curves to the raw accelerometer data and then integrate and differentiate to find the corresponding jerk, velocity and displacement profiles. So ideal lift kinematics represents a lift acceleration profile by a series of straight lines. So you'll see that in the second row. Um, so the software will therefore apply a linear regression method to fit the raw measured data to the ideal plot. So. Um, the basic methodology of the code was created and initially tested on self-generated ideal lift journeys. Uh, so this would ensure that the code could correctly follow an expected journey before tackling real-world data. 
So each isolated single trip can be separated into two phases, uh, one of acceleration and the other deceleration. Uh, therefore, for each single trip, the following analysis is carried out twice, once for each phase. Um, so firstly, you need to identify whether another phase exists. Uh, so a new phase occurs when the modulus of the acceleration reaches a threshold value, which is 50% of the maximum acceleration in the data set, as I've annotated up on the graph. Uh, so if a phase is identified, it must then be determined whether it's an acceleration or deceleration phase. Uh, this is achieved by determining whether the identified acceleration value at the threshold is positive or negative. So simply a positive acceleration value determines uh, acceleration phase and a negative value determines a deceleration phase. So linear regression analysis, if you remember from maths lessons, takes a set of x and y coordinates and finds a straight line that minimizes the sum of the squares of the residuals, uh, whereby a residual is simply the vertical distance between the coordinate and the regression line. So it is essentially just a line of best fit. Um, so in anticipation of the noise that we present in the real data, uh, the linear regression analysis is not carried out over the full length of the phase sections. Um, it was agreed that a reasonable assumption would be to carry out linear regression analysis on the segments of the sections that fall within 20% and 60% of the maximum acceleration identified at the start of the analysis. Um, so by using the equations of the linear regression lines that we find, calculations are carried out that identify their intersections with the horizontal axis, uh, noted with the crosses. Um, so we want to be able to identify the regression line length that minimizes the sum of the squares of the errors between the initial test data and the approximated curve. So this is achieved by systematically extending the regression lines, which are joined by a horizontal line until this minimum is found. And then again, so the regression analysis is repeated for the second phase of the trip, uh, with both phases joined by zero acceleration coordinates. Um, the graph here plots the approximated single uptrip profile against the up ideal uptrip, uh, confirming that software could accurately represent the data prior to testing on real data. Um, again, we differentiated the acceleration profile to get the jerk profile, which again fitted uh, the ideal profile, showing that it's worked. Um, so slightly more work goes into creating the velocity profile. Um, so from ideal lift kinematics, it's known that the integral of a single lift trip acceleration profile should equal zero, since the lift starts and ends at stationary. Um, so to tackle the anticipated accelerometer drift, should the integral of a single lift trip not equal zero, a scaling factor is applied from the difference between the integrals of the acceleration and deceleration phases. Uh, so this scaling factor is applied such the integral will equal ze zero. Um, and just to help you understand, this is what happens over multiple trips as the scaling factor is not applied. You can see the velocity profile drifting uh, when it should stay a constant. So finally, by integrating the adjusted velocity profile, you achieve the displacement profile. Again, it's matching the idea which shows it's worked. Um, and since the final displacement of each single trip can be stored, uh, repeating the analysis over multiple trips allows a spatial plot of the lift's motion to be plotted over time. Um, so at this point, it's possible to begin to see the effects of accelerometer drift as the approximation, as approximated positions can be compared to the building data. Um, so once satisfied that the code could correctly follow an ideal lift trip, uh, testing can be carried out on real data set. Uh, the introduction of real data introduced numerous issues for us to be tackled. Um, so initially, minor adjustments were made. So firstly, the raw data was calibrated by removing the effect of gravity. So this ensured that a stationary elevator would read zero acceleration. Uh, also, a simple smoothing factor was applied to remove the harshness of any data discrepancies. Um, so the main issue that was highlighted when testing on real data uh, was what arised in kinematics cases B and C. Uh, so in both these cases, the points at which the acceleration and deceleration phases meet was not joined by a horizontal line of zero acceleration, since full speed was not met. Um, so when processing the self-generated ideal cases, this has not been an issue, as the identical jerks resulted in a perfect intersection. Um, but in real data, the slight variation in jerks of the two phases occasionally resulted in the start of the second phase, intersecting with the horizontal axis before the first phase had competed, uh, completed, as you can see in the image. Um, so existing ideal lift kinematics curves are defined by a set of equations which are divided into time sections, uh, which are identified by a changing jerk. Uh, so to tackle this project, a similar approach was taken. 
So rather than plotting continuous lines, five significant points would be identified with each phase with respect to changes in acceleration. Um, so this method allowed the crossovers to be easily adjusted as well as significantly reducing the amount of data being processed. Um, so here, that was the issue and uh, with the work we managed to fix it. Um, so this is the part where I tell you whether the software actually worked. <laughs> so two sets of data were processed. Uh, the first from a high-rise building in central London with an express zone using an accelerometer included in a low-cost consumer tablet. Uh, the second was collected in a three-storey low-rise office building using a low-cost accelerometer. So this image plots the raw displacement data against the approximated spatial plot generated by the software for the 39-floor high-rise building. Uh, you can see the effects of drift are really clear if you don't have any adjustment, and it's visible how the software has managed to tackle this problem to an extent. Um, so when travelling locally between floors, the software is capable of correctly identifying the floors. Um, however, because of the limited precision of the accelerometer, it wasn't possible to determine with confidence the exact floor reached having travelled through the express zone, which is over 100 metres high. Um, so in some cases, the travel distance error having travelled through the express zone was sometimes greater than the typical floor-to-floor -floor height in the building, which was approximately four metres. Um, it was therefore not possible to calibrate the spatial plot with real building data, as the software did not identify the correct numbers of floors in the building. On the other hand, this image plots the raw displacement data without correction against the approximated spatial plot generated by the software for the three-floor low-rise building. Uh, it's again clear from the scale of the raw data the significance of drift when modelling continuous lift motion and how the software has managed to adjust for it. Um, so the lack of express zone in the low-rise <coughs> building actually allowed calibration to be carried out against real building data. So this image plots the approximated spatial plot generated by the software against the adjusted spatial plot once calibration be carried out with real building data. Um, and this table shows a comparison between the approximated floor positions found by the software and the real floor positions provided from building data. Uh, in this case, there's a maximum error of 5.6%. So is this a feasible solution to continuous logging of lift motion? Uh, one would say yes. Um, so the main challenge of the project faced was the fact that sensors are not ideal. So solving a task with idealised data does not necessarily provide a real-world solution. Um, so this became especially clear with the introduction of real-world data to the software written for ideal data. Um, the high-rise building uh, data was collected by an accelerometer integrated into a budget tablet. So the sampling frequency was inconsistent over the data set and the data contained significant noise. Uh, so this made it particularly challenging to process but ultimately left to a more robust software processing technique. Um, using the low-cost accelerometer on a uh, low-rise building, the floor positions were identified reliably with a floor position error of up to 5.6%, as I said. Um, so given that in a commercial building the floor-to-floor -floor height is typically 3 metres, um, these errors do not inhabit the floor positions being identified. Um, so, However, in the instance of a 100 metre express zone, a 5.6% error corresponds to 5.6 metres, which is greater than a typical floor-to-floor -floor height. So a more accurate sensor would be required to address this issue. Um, it must be noted that there's a relationship between noise and sampling frequency. So as in, it's possible to reduce the noise level by lowering the sampling frequency as illustrated in the image. Um, so an investigation into the optimal sampling frequency and minimum resolution in relation to this application would be worthwhile. And that is to minimise the noise without compromising the identification of the key phases of the acceleration profile. So we're actually currently in the process of investigating whether a higher quality accelerometer with a finer resolution would enable the spatial plots of high-rise buildings with express zones to be determined accurately. Thank you. <laughs>